What is up, engine heads? Welcome to another episode of Boost School, the YouTube equivalent of a university course on forced induction, made possible by none other than the good people over at AEM. In today's episode of Boost School, we'll be taking a detailed look at a turbocharger. We're gonna start things out small and simple by discovering how the turbo works and what's what on a turbocharger. And then we're gonna take the turbo, we're gonna put it apart and we're going to take a detailed look at its internals and we will explain and cover the key concepts related to turbocharging. So sit back, relax, and together, let's dive deep into the turbo. So here we have our turbo. Now the most basic observation we can make about a turbocharger is that it can be split into the hot and the cold side. The hot side houses the turbine wheel and the cold side houses the compressor wheel. All turbos get bolted onto the engine on their hot side. This part of the turbo right here is your flange and it is what gets bolted onto the exhaust manifold of your engine. This particular turbo uses a T25 flange but turbos can use many different kinds of flanges or they can use a V-band clamping system. So as your engine is running, it creates exhaust gases. Now these exhaust gases would otherwise be wasted, but on a turbocharged engine, these hot and fast moving gases are used to drive the turbine wheel. I'm going to use my air gun to simulate exhaust gases so you can see how they spin the turbine wheel as they enter the turbine housing. On the other side of the turbo, the cold side, we have the compressor wheel. The compressor wheel has a fixed connection to the turbine wheel via a common shaft. So when you spin the turbine wheel, you also spin the compressor wheel. The compressor wheel shape is designed to suck air into the turbocharger. It's called the compressor wheel because other than sucking air in, the compressor wheel also plays an important part in compressing the air, after which the air is sent through the compressor housing into your engine intake manifold and from there into your combustion chamber. This compression of air is what helps turbocharged engines make more power. At atmospheric pressure, which is the normal air pressure we all live in, there is a certain amount of air in a given amount of volume. So for example, let's say your engine has four cylinders and two liters of displacement. This means that one of your cylinders has 500 cc of displacement or volume. Now for the sake of simplicity, let's imagine that at normal atmospheric pressure, there are 1 million molecules of air in that single cylinder. An engine makes power by combusting air and fuel to create an explosion which drives the piston. The more air and fuel you have in your cylinders, the more power you can make. So how do you make more power? Well, you simply either increase the volume of your cylinders or the number of your cylinders so you can have more air and fuel in them and create greater explosions and ultimately make more power. So instead of a 2 liter 4 cylinder, you get a 3 liter or maybe a 6 cylinder and voila, you're making more power. Yes, the new engine is heavier and larger, but who cares. But what if there was another way to make more power without actually increasing the size and weight of your engine? Well, thanks to the turbo, there is. As we said, the turbocharger compresses the air, which means it actually stuffs more air into the same cylinder volume. So let's get back to our 500cc cylinder which has 1 million air molecules in it at atmospheric pressure. Now let's add a turbo to the equation. The turbocharger compresses the air so the molecules are now closer together which means there are more of them in the same amount of space. So instead of 1 million molecules the cylinder now has 1.5 million molecules of air in it and if you increase the amount of fuel given to that engine you're creating more powerful explosions with the same 500 cc of cylinder volume. The engine size hasn't increased, but the power sure has. As you can see, adding a turbocharger or increasing the pressure of an existing turbocharger increases the amount of air coming into the engine. But engines need a certain air to fuel ratio to make power, which means you need to increase the amount of fuel when you increase the amount of air. And when it comes to increasing the amount of fuel, AEMs got you covered with some top-notch fuel pumps and fuel pressure regulators to make sure your engine realizes its full potential. Links to AEM fuel pumps and other amazing products are in the video description and in the pinned comment. 
So the turbo compresses the air, it increases the pressure of the air and this leads to the natural question of how do we control the amount of pressure that a turbo generates? How do we ensure that the turbo doesn't compress the air too little or too much? Because without control the turbo would in theory just keep pressurizing the air until the excessive pressure would cause something to fail. Enter the wastegate. This is what controls the amount of pressure created by the turbo. The wastegate system consists of the actual wastegate itself and a wastegate actuator. The actuator is connected to the compressor housing via this hose. This means that any pressure created by the compressor is also exerted onto the actuator through the hose. Inside the actuator we can find a diaphragm and a spring. Once the pressure gets strong enough to overcome the resistance of the spring, the actuator will move from its resting position and because it's physically connected to the wastegate, it will open it. Again, let me demonstrate using my air gun to simulate pressure generated by the compressor wheel so you can see how pressure opens the wastegate. Once the wastegate opens, it allows exhaust gases to escape before they actually reach the turbine wheel. This means that the turbo slows down and stops building as much pressure. The system that you have just seen is an internal wastegate, meaning that it's a wastegate that's a part of the turbo itself. But turbocharged engines can also have external wastegates which are separate from the turbo. I will cover the differences between these two in one of my future videos. So we keep saying how the compressor wheel increases the pressure of the air. But how does it actually do that? To properly understand how the turbo builds pressure, we must take it apart. So off comes the wastegate actuator. The compressor housing. And finally the turbine housing, until we are left with nothing but the turbo core or cartridge. So this part of the turbo housing and this plate of the cartridge play a key part in pressurizing the air. When these two parts come together, they create the diffuser. The diffuser turns the turbulent and fast-moving low-pressure air coming off the compressor wheel into slow-moving high-pressure air. To understand how it does this, we have to take a look at the ideal gas law. Now, I won't bother you with any formulas and the only thing you have to know from the ideal gas law is that gas pressure and volume are inversely proportional. This means that as volume decreases, pressure increases, and vice versa. And as you can see, the shape of the diffuser incorporates a dramatic decrease in volume. The compressor wheel flings and stuffs the air into the narrow space, and this boat slows it down and pressurizes it. The air then travels through the volute and into the engine. But there's something else we can apply from the ideal gas law onto the turbo. As we said, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. As one decreases, the other increases. But pressure and temperature, on the other hand, are directly proportional. As pressure increases, so too does the temperature. And this makes sense. As you compress the molecules of air closer together, they start making more contact, generating more friction, and thus more heat. This is why turbos not only pressurize the air, they also heat it up. And this is why turbocharged setups very often include an intercooler. The intercooler cools the air back down to prevent the air fuel mixture in the combustion chamber from pre-igniting from being too hot. Now let's take a look at the turbo core. As you can see it consists of the turbine and compressor wheels and the center section. The center section houses the shaft and some holes. This particular turbo is oil and water cooled. It has inlets and outlets for both engine oil and coolant. Some turbos are only oil-cooled, while some, although not as common, are neither water nor oil-cooled. Water cooling is often beneficial because it helps keep engine oil temperatures in check. The turbo generates extreme amounts of heat, which can cause spikes in oil temperatures. And this can shorten both the lifespan of your turbo and your engine. Coolant circulating through the turbo helps keep oil temperatures stable. 
The compressor wheel on almost all automotive turbochargers is radial. This means that it sucks the air in in one direction, but it compresses it in another. In most cases, 90 degrees offset from the direction of the air entry. Turbochargers can also have axial compressor wheels, but these are very rare on cars and are more common on trucks and industrial machinery. The jet engine is also an example of an axial air compressor, because it compresses the air in the same direction of its movement. Inside the turbo core, we can also find some bearings. A turbocharger has two types of bearings, ones that control the radial movement of the shaft and others that control the axial movement of the shaft. The bearings that control radial movement can either be journal bearings or ball bearings. Ball bearings can be beneficial in the sense that they can offer lower friction and faster turbo spool up times. However, journal bearings are also adequate for a very wide range of applications. The bearings that control the axial movement of the shaft are called thrust bearings. The turbo can actually be seen as a simplified version of a piston engine because the turbo shaft, just like the crankshaft, has two types of bearings. You will notice that I haven't disassembled the turbocharger any further and that I have not removed the compressor and turbine wheels from the cartridge. I actually have a very good reason for this. Turbochargers spin at extremely high RPM, often in excess of 100,000 RPMs and some turbos even reach speeds of 250,000 RPMs. This is why it is absolutely critical to have the turbocharger properly balanced. A turbo is dynamically balanced by being spun on a machine at operating RPM. The machine then determines where weight needs to be removed to achieve perfect balance. This is very similar to the process of dynamically balancing a crankshaft. And you can see dimples on your crankshaft where weight was removed to achieve perfect balance. The turbo is actually balanced with the core fully assembled. And this means that removing the compressor or the turbo wheels will distort the balance. And although you can mark the wheels and retaining nuts to try and return them into the same position, this is often physically impossible. You may get it close, but you will never get it back to the exact same position where they were, which means you are potentially reducing the lifespan of the turbo. And of course, that's something nobody wants. So there you have it. This video was basically Turbo 101. And in our future videos, we will keep diving deeper into the turbo with more detailed analysis of all of its components, including different compressor wheel designs, wastegate types, bearings, and much, much more. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful and informative. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.